Well, hello again, Connecting Point Church. And today we wrap up the book of Hebrews. We're going to be going through chapter 13, the final chapter. And it's uh, a chapter that um, is interesting because it's like an appendix to the rest of the book. It's um, It reads like that. The, you have the first 12 chapters kind of make up the first part of the book where it's talking about the person and the work of Christ and and highlighting all those things. And then we come to chapter 13 and it's a series of practical Christian uh, living instructions um, that are to be lived in light of who Jesus is, in light of the work that he's done on our behalf. Um, the author then enters into this um, mode of instructing the reader on here's some things you need to remember and things that you need to pay attention to. So before we get into all of that, I'd like you to consider this first table talk question, which is this, how do we practically show love to one another? Think about that for a minute, and then we'll come back and dive into the text. Okay, let's get right into it, Hebrews chapter 13. Starting at the first verse, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. For by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison, and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money, and be content with what you have, because God has said, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, The Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Of course, in the last part of that text, he, the author is quoting the Old Testament, uh, Deuteronomy 31.6, which um, is similar to, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. And then a response to that from the Psalms, 100 and, Psalm 118, uh, verse 6 and 7, The Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? So verses 1 to 6 here really kind of map out for us what I'm going to just call the scope of love. That talks about the scope of love, and it starts with love one another. And the word used for love one another here is brotherly love. And this repeats Christ's command to his disciples in John 13 34 and the the Hebrews the author of Hebrews is reminding believers of this statement where Jesus begins the statement by saying a new command I give you this is something new for you to do love one another as but it's not just love one another it's love as I have loved you so you must love one another and that's found in John chapter 13 verse 34 and it's that caring brotherly love that familial love that we have the next piece is um, about do not forget to show hospitality to strangers and the the word there is also a derivative from the same word that is brotherly love be hospitable show brotherly love to strangers because he says you never know who you're talking to and, and this isn't so much as a warning, well, you better be careful because, you know, you might be entertaining angels. It's, it's more given in the spirit of God is pleased when you show love to one another. And, um, and so it goes from sort of loving people you're familiar with, perhaps your church, members of your family, etc., people you're close to, to then being able to show love for those that you don't even know, love to strangers, being accepting and loving. And then it talks about caring for those in prison and those who suffer. 
And the reality in those days was that some Christians were in prison for their faith. And uh, their care, and sometimes even their food and, and things they needed to care for themselves, depended on those outside of the prison. And the, the author is reminding them to be attentive to those um, as if you were together with them in prison, to show them care, and, and those who are mistreated, to show them care, um, as if you were suffering. The reality of the issue was that sometimes people were afraid to identify with those in prison because they would then be, um, you know, spotted as or identified as people who were in the same uh, situation and they maybe didn't want to end up in prison or suffering. Uh, but the author here is saying, you know, to care, to, to don't worry about that, but to provide care for those in prison. So the scope goes from those who are that we're familiar with to those who are even strangers and to those who are in prison and suffering, that the, the love is to be extended to that, to, uh, along those lines. And then it, the author turns the corner and he talks about, he or she, talks about the more intimate uh, aspect of love where he says marriage is to be respected by everyone. This is a high value in the Christian world. In the ancient world, this view of being faithful in marriage was unusual and in many sectors of the Roman world considered unreasonable. But in God's standard, the expectation is that um, we honor marriage and purity is the, is the standard that we live up to. And anything outside of that it says God will judge that. So honor and purity is the standard God expects when it comes to marriage. Um, I find this interesting because in the world we live in, in our cultural context, um, the Christian view of marriage and the ex expectations around that are, uh, I'd say, starting to become somewhat like maybe the ancient Roman world where people think it's, that well, they either don't think about it, it's uh, unusual for people, or sometimes if they're confronted with it, they think it's unreasonable to be able to be married and to be faithful. But that is, um, the, the, that is God's design, and it being God's design is the most fulfilling design. And it's the most fulfilling way to express love is in the context of faithfulness and particularly faithfulness in marriage. Then finally, in this description of the scope of love, uh, the author mentions something not to love, and that is money. Don't, don't direct your love that way. Um, this speaks to contentment. Contentment is a result of fully trusting in God. And the two Old Testament references included here that we mentioned speak of God's faithful presence and care. Being obsessed with money, obsessed with wealth, or focused and, or loving money, which of course the Apostle Paul says elsewhere that the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. But loving money is wrong because it expresses uh, a distrust for God's faithfulness to us. And our, our focus should be on God's faithfulness, not on the acquisition of wealth. So it's a matter of priority. So here's the scope of love. Lo loving one another, those that we're familiar with, um, extending love to strangers, be, being hospitable and kind, caring for those either in prison or suffering for faith, um, modeling love through the marriage relationship, and how family then as a result of that becomes an a, a example of how love is lived out, and finally being careful in terms of where we express love to, in, in 
love is not something we do. Sometimes love is something we don't do in terms of let's not love money. But um, the loving life should also be um, expressed in a sense of contentment because God is faithful. So that's an interesting way to start this chapter in light of who Jesus is, in light of the work that he's done, which we've gone over in the first 12 chapters. How do we live? Well, beginning with love. So let's go to a table talk. In what ways do you find this description of the scope of love challenging? And in which area are you challenged to pursue growth? Give you a few minutes to wrestle with that, and then we'll come back and continue. Okay, we pick it up now in uh, Hebrews 13:7, and we'll read from 7 uh, to 19, and then we'll take a look at that. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life, and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by eating ceremonial foods, which is of no benefit to those who do so. We have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered, suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name, and do not forget to do good and to share with others, for which such sacrifices God is pleased. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. Pray for us. We are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. I particularly urge you to pray so that I may be restored to you soon. So this section, 7, um, we went to 19, but 7 to 17 particularly, is written in a similar fashion to a chiasm. We've been through that on, on several occasions. Uh, Tyler has taught us what that means. It's a, it's a style of writing uh, used uh, by, he, by Jewish authors. And this is written in a similar way um, with the middle section highlighting the difference between the grace of Jesus Christ and the ritual nature of religion. Um, in these verses, the author is reminding them to hold to the truth taught by their leaders. So what you'll see in, if you observe the text is verse 7 talks about leaders, remember your leaders. Verse 8 talks about Jesus Christ being the same yesterday and today and forever. Then he gets into the section on strange teaching and uh, um, then identifying with Christ, not religious ritual. And then by the time you get to verse 15, um, it relates back to verse 8, where in 15 it says, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. Of course, verse 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And then when we get to verse 17, and we'll look at all these, but at verse 17 it says, Have confidence in in your leaders and submit to their authority which he starts that section in verse 7 remember your leaders so he goes from the leaders to Jesus Christ into this thing about the superiority of Jesus over religious ritual back to Jesus 
and then back to liters and so you can see how it is in the similar um, vein as a chiasm with um, in the style that he's writing so let's have a look through these um, we just said the author is binding them to hold to the truth taught by their leaders remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you however let's do some qualification here these leaders that are being referred to there's some assumptions that I think are in place here number one is they speak the word of God so that means they're familiar with the word of God they're well versed in the word of God they understand the word of God and then it says consider the outcome of their ways not only can they speak it and study it look at it understand it whatever but they also model the life of faith the life that is shaped by the Word of God so they spoke the Word of God they modeled the life of faith and it's based on Jesus Christ who never changes It's the same yesterday and today and forever and of course from Hebrews 1 all the way through to the end of Hebrews 12 the the real focus is on the person and the work of Jesus Christ and, and uh, all that means and so there, the assumption on leaders, you speak the word of God, you live the word of God, and you're paying attention that it's really centered on who Jesus is. Why is he saying this? Because he wants to protect the readers from strange teachings that are going around, which we can glean from the context we're holding to elements of Judaism and the the ritual of the temple and what the author is saying is that strength is found in grace not in the works of Judaistic ritual not in the works so he's saying strength strength for what strength for living strength for being obedient strength for living the life that God has for us is found in his grace in the work of Jesus not in the temple rituals. He even goes so far as saying the burning of the sacrificed animals, so the sacrifice happened in the Holy of Holies, but then the bodies were taken out of there and burned or destroyed outside of the camp. And the author here implies that, he, that this anticipates Jesus suffering outside the city, not in the not in the temple not in the city remember when Jesus died on was dying on the cross and he, you know he says that statement it is finished and then the, the um, curtain that separated the Holy of Holies the presence of God from the people that curtain was torn and the presence of God then was released to all men and we'll see this You'll see this in the book of Acts at the time of Pentecost as the Holy Spirit then is poured out on all flesh. And the suffering of Christ was outside the city, not in the city. Well, why is that significant? So where we identify with Christ in his death is not in the holy place, in the temple. Because we are not looking for a temporal religious location of worship, but rather the author talks about anticipating the city that is to come, the eternal city, the city that is outside of the ritual of religion, but rather found in God and his grace. This is... Um, described by Jesus in John chapter 4 in verse 24 when Jesus is speaking to the woman at the well and they're talking about should we worship on this mountain or that mountain and in John 4 24 Jesus says to the woman God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in in the spirit and truth and, and he's talking about God ident we, we identify with God directly as a spirit because when our spirits are made alive we have direct connection when we are born again when we repent of our sins we come to him 
we have direct access to God who is spirit and we worship him in the spirit and we worship him in truth. And so it's happening outside of the idea of works, outside of the idea of religious ritual. And again in Revelation 21, 2 and 3 in this reference to the city that is to come. In Revelation, the John the writer who had the vision, he says, I saw the holy city the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. So through Jesus, we are to offer to God the sacrifices of praise through our profession and doing good and sharing with others. Through, our, through the uh, confession from our mouth or the expression from our lips, as he says in the, in the text. He then comes to verse 17 where he says, have confidence in your leaders. And the qualifier for that is verse 7, as we looked at. And then in verse 18, the leader who is writing this requests their prayers, for their desire is to live honorably in every way. So this, this whole section goes through, the leaders have a responsibility to teach the right stuff. And if they do, they're protecting the people from the wrong stuff, from the, from the um, strange teaching, from mixing up Christianity with ritual. One author that I read said it's, it, it's unnecessary to have a Jesus plus view of the gospel. I have Jesus plus I have to do this, that, and the other thing. No, Jesus is sufficient. His grace is sufficient for our salvation. It is sufficient to transform our lives and so that we live the right way. And so we put our faith in his grace. We put our faith in the sufficiency of the work of Christ it's spoken of right through the book of Hebrews. And we're not looking for a religious symbol. We're not looking for a religious location. We're not looking for the earthly city where we has religious significance. We are anticipating the city that is to come. We're anticipating that day when we will dwell with God fully. As the author of Revelation says, God's dwelling place is now among the people. We will dwell with God. And so we praise Jesus through our, our confession and we praise him by doing good and sharing with others. Those are expressions of our praise. And then it says, have, quali have confidence in your leaders. And that assumes the leaders are doing the right things. So, with all of that in mind, from those texts, from those verses, here's the table talk. How do you know strange teaching when you hear it? And what keeps you from being carried away by it? Take a few minutes and then we'll come back and wrap it up. We now come to the final section of Hebrews 13 and the final words of this book. In verse 20, it says, Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Then he ends off with a few greetings, brothers and sister, I, sisters, I urge you to bear with my word of ex exhortation, for in fact I have written to you quite briefly. I want you to know that our brother Timothy has been released. If he arrives soon, I will come with him to see you. Greet all your leaders and the Lord's people. Those from Italy send you their greetings. Grace be with you all. But I'd like to conclude our time in Hebrews just with verses 20 and 21. 
So we'll read the we'll read verse 20 and 21 as a final benediction and final exhortation um, from what we've been experiencing and learning through the book of Hebrews. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with every thing good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.